um, to replace, so to speak, uh, Crystal Woodward, who directs the Safe at School working um, in group and, uh, and an initiative at the American Diabetes Association. Um, so we, the intent was at 9 o'clock to review 35 slides that looks over all of the legislation, both federal and state, as an introduction that impacts care of children at school. Quite briefly, and I should mention the disclaimer, which um, is a slide way back here, that I suppose technically I should go back to, and that is that, believe me, I am not an attorney, um, and I'm not providing Let me get a specific... I'll get that for you. Oh, look, I can go all the way back. It woke up, that's what it was. Or maybe... Okay, so I'm gonna read this, and please forgive me, but... Okay, so while the American Diabetes Association attempts to ensure that all information is accurate current, this general information about potential legal protections and medical best practices is not a substitute for individualized legal or other expert advice and assistance. The American Diabetes Association and staff and volunteers do not provide legal or medical advice or represent you. For detailed legal advice or representation, contact and consult an independent attorney and for healthcare consultation and advice consult with a professional healthcare provider. And so, as I said at the 9 a.m. session, that's kind of like that disclaimer that you hear at the end of the drug commercials that says, oh, by the way, this drug has side effects that include blah, 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 blah. Right. So, uh, keep that in mind. And so, again, the purpose of these two presentations is to make you all aware of what your legal rights are when it comes to working with your child's school. Um, in some cases, uh, we, we talked about daycare, and that question came up that hopefully we'll address with regards to what happens when they're going off to college and university. Okay. And there are specific, quite honestly, um, laws when it comes to even in the workplace. Okay, an individual with type one diabetes is, in legal terms, let me be very clear, in legal terms, it is a disability. I know all of us as families of uh, children loved ones that have type 1 diabetes really focus on empowerment and yeah, having type 1 diabetes, there's no doubt is a hassle, but it should not, and this is my personal philosophy, and I think it probably applies to most of you, is it should not be a major barrier to what it is that you want to do in life. Okay, so I'm going to fast forward, and believe me, um, the first session was supposed to be um, less interactive, but, you know, I have trouble ignoring questions. So, um, it took a little longer than anticipated, but again, for any of you that weren't here at nine o'clock, um, if you have specific questions, please feel free to, 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 to um, let me know. There are lots of acronyms that make things confusing. So, um, the best example that's not listed on this slide is, what's the ADA? Well, it's the American Diabetes Association. Oh, by the way, it also is the American with Disabilities Act. So, um, DMMP, I, I like this slide because it says, you know, what it covers and who writes it. Diabetes Medical Management Plan, okay? That's the healthcare team in conjunction with all of you. It's what to do high, low, what the insulin doses are, do they use CGM, when can they use CGM, when do they need a finger stick, who to call if there's a problem, you know, what their symptoms are, how to deal with all of it. It is really the medical plan to try and address all the potential scenarios that might <laughs> impact your child while they're at school, okay? The 504 plan, um, or the IEP team, Individual Education Plan, that specifically pertains to education plans. Details both healthcare and education, education related uh, services, accommodation, special education services. So, this is healthcare, this impacts obviously what happens when they're at school with regards to testing, and I don't mean blood glucose testing, I mean you know standardized tests, exams, quizzes, all of that, because we all know that variations in blood sugar impact their ability to, to concentrate and focus, obviously if they're having a low or if they're really high. But, you know, this is where you go armed with the Diabetes Medical Management Plan to the school and you arrange a meeting with their 504 team. Okay. 
um, or their individual education plan. The individual health plan is a school nursing care plan developed by the school nurse that specifies how diabetes care is prescribed in the diabetes medical management plan will be delivered in the school. Okay, so really the point of contact with the school is supposed to be the school nurse. Depending on the school district, um, the individual school, sometimes that school nurse may cover, unfortunately, three different schools. Right? They're, they need to have somebody that's a designee that's responsible for assisting your child in managing your diabetes while they're in school. Okay? And then a quick reference is a loose, sorry, resource tool for school staff. How to recognize and treat hypo and hyperglycemia. And that's developed by the school nurse. Now, you all are a tremendous resource to that school nurse. Right? Um, we talked about some uh, tools that were developed by school nurses, in some cases in conjunction with families, that says, yes, the school nurse is responsible for everything, but for that bus driver, okay? Here's a sheet. It's got the, your, your child's name, preferably their photograph, and some essentials. They have type 1 diabetes. This is what happens when they're low. They look like this, or, and this is what we do. Kind of simple things, really the real critical things that if it happens on the school bus, you want to make sure that there's somebody prepared to deal with it. Who and what, well, I should say, what they can do is very much dependent upon the state, well, federal legislation obviously impacts. We're going to spend a lot of time talking about that. But at the state, and even sometimes at the school district and individual school level, sometimes they have policies. If there's federal funding that goes to that school, they have to abide by federal, but then there are some things. I mentioned at the 9 a.m. session, in the New York City public school district, the only individual that can administer insulin to a student is a registered nurse. And you might say, gosh, I mean, how many registered nurses do they, do they have? Or do they have? Um, they didn't have enough before. Following, unfortunately, something that got escalated to the level of lawsuits, um, they now have a, you know, they basically either have to designate people that can do it, or have school nurse at school trips, and on the bus, and all of that other stuff, right? But again, it's what's necessary, what's guaranteed versus uh, according to the federal law, and then the school has some latitude as to how they satisfy those requirements but they're constrained sometimes by local and state laws. Okay. Um, Can I say real quick? Please. please. There is information of state by state information at the Safe at School ADA website. So you can look up your particular state and any unique thing that is a requirement there should be listed. There are a lot of excellent resources about your rights at school and uh, information that you can even um, point your school staff administrators to as well. That helps clarify those things. And these slides should be available on the CW website and all the subsequent links. And I've got a few, um, I think two slides at the end that list a number of specific um, websites. Okay. So, um, Janet, don't blush, but this is online. This is the DMMP, the Diabetes Medical Management Plan that has been developed by the Safe at School Working Group, led by Jennifer, okay? Um, I think I mentioned I am co-chair of that Safe at School Working Group, Karen Herman, who's a nurse um, in Colorado, is the other co-chair, and we've got working group uh, members. And to develop this, we got input from school nurses, from parents, from providers to try to provide the most comprehensive plan, taking into account the latest technologies that are available. Um, this is available if you go to diabetes.org forward slash DMMP. There is a link there. And again, I said this at 9 o'clock, I'll say it again. There's a pop-up um, that comes up that uh, asks you to donate to the ADA. Sorry for that, um, you don't have to. Um, but if you close that dialog box, there is a link to the PDF. The PDF allows you to type in things, and then what we've done in our institution is ask folks to email it to us so that we can complete it, send it back to the parent and the school, and um, again, it's very, very comprehensive. You can't, 
I don't expect you to be able to read this, but on page one, on this top, top right hand corner, it says parent guardian sections. And it tells you, it directs you to what sections we'd like for you to fill out. Okay. And believe me, this makes it easier. Um, again, it's a lot of work up front. You guys are used to that, quite honestly. But it's very comprehensive. It, uh, I, I've said it before, and I can admit this, my handwriting is horrible. So when I fill these out, in my own handwriting, it's difficult to read, it's now typed in, it's very clear. Um, as I said, it's very comprehensive, and there are sections that apply, and you know, if your child isn't on a pump, well then those other sections don't apply. Jen, please. So I wanted to add that this is something that we really want you to do now. Yeah. So we want you to do this during your, your doctor visit. We want you to have a conversation, because what happens is folks don't do it until the week before. We get hundreds of forms at once, and then we're scrambling just to put doses in. We don't want that. We want to know if your child requires snacks at recess. We want to know if you use temporary basal. We want to know what you do to prevent hypoglycemia. That takes a conversation. And we just can't do it if we have hundreds of forms to complete. So think about this now. Download the form. It even will accept the screenshot of your child's face, which we really like. Uh, it adds their cell phone number, the child's cell phone number, all kinds of new information on there. So um, we encourage you to do this now while you're visiting your doctor and not waiting until the last minute so that it's more comprehensive and you have more input into it and we're not just kind of sending them out insanely the week before class or sometimes they literally call us from school. We have this child here. They cannot come in because they don't have orders. And we're just typing them out and sending something so that the child can stay. Thanks, Jen. And so, again, the other important thing is, um, I went back to this slide, because this, the Diabetes Medical Management Plan, then allows you to do all of this. And if you're not getting this done ahead of time, how are you going to meet with the school to develop the accommodations with regards to X, Y, or Z if you don't know what the basic needs are? So, um, covering that, okay. Diabetes Medical Man Management Plan, okay? Serves as a foundation for the 504 plan, or Individual Education Plan. It's designed by the student's diabetes provider, sets out how the student's diabetes needs will be met at the school, including, and this form is great for that, field trips, lockdowns. You might say, well, uh, my child doesn't get Lantus at school, right? Why should they need to be on there? Well, you know, if God forbid, there's a lockdown or if uh, there's a school trip and it's overnight and so forth, as the kids get older, it's nice to be able to have all that information there, okay? Um, one thing that, uh, I'll stop that here and let me see if it's, yeah, I'm gonna go back there. Um, page four, right, it's a lengthy six page four. The reason that we're really strongly advocating, and this is in our own practice and across the country, we've talked to providers, we're talking to parents and so forth, I'll mention at the end, there's a, a, a couple of webinars coming up um, that'll address this as well. Page four is a standalone page that specifically talks about insulin doses, whether on a pump that it's got their basal rates or they're on multiple daily injections or a sliding scale or what have you. It allows you to document all of that. It's signed by the healthcare team. You've done the six pages, you've gone through all of that, right? As, as your provider to sign off on it. If during the school year there's a dose change, got to imagine that happening, right? This form allows you to just, the, the provider and you separately to, to sign off on that page four, one page, and they don't, you don't have to redo the whole thing. So I think that's a really big advantage that was built in. Yes, I'm gonna take my mask. Sorry, four seconds. Okay, so, um, what's included in that form, and I'm not gonna go through it page by page because I say it's, it's very extensive, but emergency contact information, right? Do they do finger sticks? How often? Do they use CGM? Um, are they, hopefully not, on a generation four Dexcom that requires a decalibrated routine? That kind of thing. Um, glucagon administration, okay? That sometimes um, is subject to individual school policy, but we feel strongly that if a child is at school, school needs to be able to give glucagon, okay? You know, are they using the standard glucagon emergency kit. Is it GVOC? Is it XED, right? So having that information. 
exercise in sports, what to do. You know, Janet spends a lot of time speaking to families and quite honestly school nurses about use, uh, if they're on a pump, temporary basis, temporary exercise targets, things like that. All things that can be accommodated and listed in this form. Uh, and again, as I mentioned before, recognition and treatment of hypoglycemia and hyperglycemia. This is an individualized form. Each of your children likely have similar symptoms when they're high or low. Maybe not. Maybe they don't have symptoms at all. So all that is listed here so that, in, in all honesty, it's not just you dictating to the school, but providing them information so that if they look across the room and they say, Sally's getting a little glassy-eyed, and you know, I reviewed this form, and, and that's a symptom. She may be low or high. So it at least assist them in providing assistance to your child. Um, insulin administration, is it syringes, vials, is it pens, is it smart pens, is it pumps, or hybrid closed loop systems, or even do it yourself, closed loop systems, right? Um, at least an indication of that. Meal and snack schedule, and then level of self-care. Um, this is something that we strongly, strongly advocate. I think all of you as parents ideally want your child, by the time they move out on their own, that they are quote, perfect diabetic, whatever that means, right? So they're able to um, confidently manage their diabetes. And given how much time they spend at school, this is an opportunity for you to partner with the school nurse or the support staff to have an ongoing dialogue saying, well, yeah, at home they do all this, but maybe at school they don't want to do that. Or, gosh, I've been having trouble with my teenager, and I always throw them under the bus, I say that all the time. Uh, you know, but, but, you know, yeah, he knows about this. He's had diabetes, I'm gonna say it's Johnny here. Um, he's had diabetes for 10 years. He knows all this stuff, but, you know, he gets distracted at school um, and it's not happening. So you may not be aware of that unless the school nurse communicates that to you. And then you can have this ongoing dialogue to, and again, no 17 year old wants to be forced to go to the school nurse to get their insulin. But if they're not otherwise getting their insulin, it may be a temporary, remedy to try to get Johnny back in, in, the, in, the, in the group of doing that. Can I say too? Yeah. It's really important, especially when they're a little bit older, when they're diagnosed, because the school systems may not be accustomed to seeing kids regularly at that age if they have a brand new diagnosis or a brand new device. That's something that we would do temporarily to make sure that they get the support at school that they need when they need it, um, even when most kids classically aren't getting that level of support. There's a massive difference between the school nurse in an elementary school versus one in a middle school and one in a high school. So we have to be really clear when more support is needed when they're not accustomed to giving it at that age. Questions about the medical management plan? Yes, ma'am. Sorry, first of all. Um, second of all, uh, is it a school that gets federal funding? They gotta make other accommodations. If they don't have a school nurse, they have to have somebody that's responsible to be trained to do all these things. Um, it should be the school nurse, perhaps for the district. Um, in many centers like ours, I can't tell you the number of times that Janet has gone out to a school because it's their first job with diabetes or maybe they're on a new technology or something. Um, so you have resources available, but legally, that school is responsible for, for, for providing someone um, that is going to be the point person. And maybe, again, um, the overseer may be the school nurse that's for multiple schools or the district, but, but they have to have that in place. There should be someone responsible for the health of the children at, at the school system there, level. There is. Yes. Uh, she's just not... There. Physically, there. She's yeah. just required to be at, like, do things with the children at the school so many hours yeah. a month. You know, she does like the, the flu shot clinics and all of the, the teachings. Of is it like a public health nurse? Yes. Yeah, sometimes they are, yeah. yeah. There is some sort of a system, um, and sometimes you have uh, non licensed people performing things at school. Uh, and then you know, I would elicit the help of your medical team with training. We do it all the time, but not every center is the same. We're at an academic center. We have a full team. Um, so it, it's going to vary. I'm not going to say that everybody's going to offer that. But um, 
organizations like the JDRF, local groups, uh, I feel like are a great place to start. You're going to find connections there that might be able to assist you. Even your own uh, pump trainer, if you went through the company, like we do our own education, but if you're at a small endo office, maybe that tandem pump trainer is willing to go teach basics. So uh, I wish it, you didn't have to be so industrious uh, in your position to get what you need, but sometimes um, you do. And the ADA is always advocating, guiding, and, and helping. And there's all kinds of question and answer and ways to ask questions of organizations like that in the JDRF. So, and you should point out, yeah, you and, should point out. And we spend a lot of time, and, and again, folks, I apologize if you're here tonight and you can hear it again, but you know, it's it's this idea of approaching it collaboratively. Right. Um, you don't want to be, in my opinion, the bull in the china shop. You don't want to walk in with an attorney in tow saying, you have to do this, and I've seen it happen. Right. Um, but, but you also, again, need to arm yourself with knowledge, know what, to, what tools to reference them to, and again, the ADA, not only has this kind of information for you all as parents, but they have um, a school guide and training modules that are available free of charge to the school nurses. I mean, we, we typically once a year will meet with um, nearly 300 school nurses uh, for Hillsborough County. County. Um, and we do a training, we, and Janet does sessions with other counties as well. So again, there are resources available. Um, you know, I would say empower yourself with knowing what the laws are and, and saying, hey, you know, this is what we'd like to do for your information, this is this, and, and not saying, oh, my attorney's here, you know, they'll talk to your attorney. My daughter and my nephew are the only two recycling. So you're, you're making it much easier for the next family to come to us. Yeah, you're paving the way. <laughs> yes, ma'am. If it's school, uh, you know, associated, yes. So you I know. know. I mean, is that, it's like there's two actual programs at the elementary school, one from the YMCA, one from the, the city parks and rec department. So they're definitely like getting federal funding, but they're not a part of the school. Yeah. And in my interactions, brief interactions with the after school, the inclusion yeah. person, Again, if it's school sponsored, again, I had, had mentioned in the uh, earlier session, and it sounds a little bit cynical, but you know, you might imagine a school that says, well, we have to do it if we sponsor it, but if we get somebody else to sponsor it, then we don't have to cover this. So I would say find out what, what the details are, and maybe even, you know, if the school says, no, this isn't our gig, um, maybe approaching the YMCA. And yeah, say, well, the, the <coughs> So there, there is the Medicine Center at UCSF, um, terrific diabetes center. Um, even if your child isn't individually uh, seen there, um, you can reach out to them. I'm sure they'd be willing to provide you some direction. You're welcome. My guess is yes, that they are required. There's lots of documents no, no at guessing. the ADA website <laughs> that I encourage you to look through and share with those folks. Okay. Yeah. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. And Not in my general. experience, I go out to the Y all the time, and I teach them how to care fully for our kids with T1D. They're there a long time. The parents are working till like 6.30, picking them up pretty late, yeah. and they took, take full care of our even little guys. So, um, yeah, I think uh, I would continue to pursue that because I believe, yes, they are required to provide care. So moving from the DMMP that you need, where everything kind of downstream, the 504 plan, okay? And so again, this is where the ADA provides a template if the school doesn't already have one uh, for a 504 plan. Again, written document, parents, guardians, and school agree on service modifications that the students needs. Obviously, if you're going in with the knowledge of what, um, what the laws are, you're in a much better position to make sure that they're doing everything that they should be doing. Um, it's individualized. It, nothing, and again, I'm just preaching to the choir here, none of this should be rubber stamped, right? Children may be similar in some respects, but, you know, whether it be highs, lows, what their treatment plan is and so forth, it's all individualized. So their 504 plan should be as well. Individual, okay? Additional benefits of having a 504 plan, although otherwise uh, sometimes referred to as an individual education plan, Helps to clarify roles, responsibilities, and expectations for the school, student, and guardian, right? It's, it's validation of the fact that they have this health condition that they need um, additional accommodations when it comes to um, you know, their, their, their school experience, okay? So it also permits, one of, the, one of the benefits is it permits the student to understand the accommodations that are available to them, help him or her focus on their education, right? Um, the whole goal here is for them to go to school have the same benefits and experiences as much as possible as kids that don't have diabetes, okay? Um, and again, you know, not that we're advocating to be litigious here, but there are laws to protect them, to provide uh, for these accommodations. They should have the same benefit as children without diabetes. Can I say real quick? Absolutely. Uh, we know for a fact that there's a large turnover in the education world, in the nursing, uh, uh, school nurses, we have experienced large turnover. There's a lot of um, new education that needs to happen every year to advocate for our kids. So um, I can tell you with 100% certainty, um, no one goes into school nursing that isn't there because they have a huge heart and really want to help kids. It is one of the hardest nursing roles I've ever, I've done it temporarily. I'm well, a well-trained nurse and it brought me to my knees pretty quick. So I, I just want to say that um, there's, I'm sorry to say that the education falls heavily on you guys. And we always want to make it with a spirit of goodwill to help not only your child, but every child that's going to come to that location in the future. And when things are done in that spirit, um, they work well, but you have to start at the top. If it's a brand new principal that just became principal for the first time, sometimes they have no idea that they're like, yeah, that's too much. They don't even know that this is not an optional thing. So tread lightly, keep it positive, and you know, and I wish I could tell you it's not gonna happen. I think probably every parent has to make those inroads constantly and continue to do that unless you get really, who got really lucky and has a school nurse that has tons of experience, lots of kids, you didn't have to lay any groundwork at all. Two hands, four hands in the room. It's, it, it is, yeah, and um, you have a lot of friends. Seek out the JVRF, seek out the ADA, talk to your healthcare team, and there's a lot of us that are eager to support you, to support the school nurses, to make this all the best it can be for that child. And again, stating the obvious here, when all of you signed on to be the parent of a type one <laughs> child, um, nobody told you, or maybe they did, and hopefully not in a gentle way, but you know, you, you now became a medical professional, and uh, you're a legal scholar, and uh, you're an expert in insurance and pharmacy, right? 
it all comes with the package. But the fact that you all are here speaks volumes to your, you know, desire to be empowered and, and have the knowledge. Yes, ma'am. So they have to follow the doctor's orders and they have to follow the medical protocols. But what if they're not? <laughs> so and, and it's like so bad. Yeah. So that's where, um, again, you know, I'm not probably telling you anything you don't already know. You start with the school nurse. That's your point of contact. Um, you may, and I don't know what your situation is. I've had situations where the school nurse was fully supportive, but as Janet said, and this has happened, you know, the principal says, well, this is my school, and I'm, I'm lord and master here, so I don't want to do that. So, you know, it, it's figuring out what the situation is, knowing what your rights are. Um, if it comes to, and I'm not saying this is step one, this is step later, right? If you have done your diligence in, in bringing to them what the responsibilities are, and they're not responding, um, our situation is the local ADA board, it was very fortunate that the chair of our board was a health attorney. And she volunteered that if you were having this issue, drop her a line, she would just put a, basically a standard note on legal letterhead that you can send to the school. And it's amazing. Sometimes it's just that. All of a sudden. A letter from some lawyer. Yeah. Magically. Right. Um, so, so all of this is on the ADA website, but I'm saying locally you can contact your local ADA. Um, there, there are resources available to you. But not yet. Um, go ahead. No, go ahead. Finish. No, but but the issue is there are resources available, and again, the 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 two take home messages here are be prepared, and again, you know, you should always start from a point of collaboration. Start, yeah, start with them. Or do, do they not understand? We, I, I'm an RN, I'm not an advanced practice nurse. I have to follow written orders. So we have to have a little sympathy for them because they really have to, they can't go off script and make, you know. But she's saying they're not doing what's No, I understand, I understand. So the example is, he's, when he's loved, and he's the furthest pattern from their Of course. So that's education. Yep. That's definitely education. That's a safety issue. So this isn't just what you want. We don't want our kids buddying up and walking through hallways alone up to a nursing stairs. station. Yep. So that's inappropriate uh, given what we have today. I'm assuming he's on a sensor. It's not necessary. It's unsafe. So that requires uh, more education. And if they're not following it, I would go, I want to know if that child comes to our clinic. Because I will advocate for you. If it's not getting through, I'll get the doctor to write a little a note that we'll fax over that says, it seems that we're not being clear. Let me clarify, the child is to not move. They are to treat where they are. And you know when their blood sugars are normal, if they're continuing to drop, then you can we don't want to send them, but we don't expect the classroom to treat four times either, right? Yeah. So, but, like, I don't know if everything, but like, we, we arranged like a whole call with everybody in the school district and us and the endocrinology team, like the doctor gives their afternoon of patients, and the school district hung up on them. Mm -hmm. So, this is where um, there are some buzzwords, right? So, arm yourself with the information, liability, right? That's a liability mm -hmm. issue. And it's clearly, I mentioned earlier, there was a slide of every organization that supports this. So it's not just the American Diabetes Association, it's not just children with diabetes, it's the American Academy of Pediatrics, it's the Pediatric Endocrine Society, it's the Endocrine Society, it's every organization, professional organization, that deals with issues related to type one diabetes, supports this as being the standard. And because of a lot of that advocacy, there are laws that specifically require so again, you've tried being nice, you've tried to be understanding, um, you've laid all this out and they're not responding and that's where you have um, the 
individual rights and you have uh, remedies that so you can pursue. Will you be a practicing attorney at what they get to Oh, no. So, so the issue is, again, right, there, there's kind of a chain of command, and there are folks here in the room, fortunately, that can speak to this, but, you know, you go to the school nurse, if there's no response there, you know, it's likely the principal, and if it's not, it's the, you know, the, the district manager, what have you, the, the school, school board. board. Yeah. I mean, just so, keep going up. Yeah. 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 Keep going up and just documenting it all the way up. Yeah, and there's, there's a slide that I have later on, and, and hopefully since this is the first talk still, um, that um, when you have these communications, preferably email, document, right? Documentation that you've made every effort to, to reach out to the appropriate personnel, that you have this diabetes medical management plan, that you know all of this, and you know, quite honestly, you're, you're, you have every legal right, and if they're not responding, you know, ultimately you have legal remedies. Yes, Justin, please. Um, make sure everything you do is in the email. Yeah. Mm -hmm. email. Yep. Yeah. And you use the word liability. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, this is, you know, and they will, we have the same problem. Teach, but what's down to the teacher, sending the kid down the hall by itself, you know, when I'm during a load. So, you just got to use the word liability and you know that it, you do get their backups. You have to say, look, you know, this is really a liability issue, you know, and try to be nice about it. And, and then you just go, like they said, go off the chain of command, but you also can get your doctor to write a letter if you can. Yeah, the thing, after they got the they said, whatever you need, we will give you. See, you should have started with that. Um, <laughs> okay. I'm so sorry. Yeah. We, yeah. We, we, we had a whole six months of it. Yeah. Um, so, so all, the more, all the more reason you don't want to figure this out on day one of school. Um, that you're in, you know, hopefully but not. But you do want a diabetes expert talking directly yeah. to them to say, that's bad practice. That is bad practice, it's unsafe, and you're placing that child at risk coming from someone like us to get to the core of it and to talk to the right people, to copy the directors. And, uh, the yeah. and that note from the Tons attorney is perfect. Okay. When you start talking and saying that word liability, oh, yeah. they start to wake up. So again, you know, it's in red. The ideal, we all start from, is working together on this. Okay, so um, again, it's this the school should have a 504 IEP coordinator. All right, many times it's the school principal, the guidance counselor. Um, they may initiate uh, a development plan if they, again, from their end, suspect that the student needs special education or related services. Again, the IEP has and the 504 plan has all to do about the learning environment, how to make the accommodations in that regard. And again, it follows from the diabetes. Um, an evaluation for eligibility under 504 or the Individual with Diabetes Education Act or I, Individual Education Plan. Again, sorry for all these acronyms. These aren't mine. Okay. Um, any attorneys in the room? <laughs> oh, yes, we have a it's okay. I know I'm a doctor, but I don't discriminate against attorneys. I want you to know their <laughs> hand went like this. <laughs> I'm not going to point out who it is. I'm just saying. <laughs> but it's kind of on that. So, no. Um, but yeah, I mean, this is this is the, the, the jargon that's used. Um, it's all very important. But again, this is why we're spending today two hours on this. Okay, because it's important. Um, once an eligibility determination, uh, so by the way, so evaluation eligibility conducted by school staff knowledgeable about your child. And I'll go into the individuals in a moment. Once the determination is made, 504 IEP team. Gets together, they come up with a written plan. Um, important pieces of the diabetes toolbox for all students with diabetes. Again, be prepared. Right? Don't wait for there to be a problem. You kind of want all this laid out. And again, it's not that your child needs to have experienced all these things or you need to have imagined all of these things. There are tools available with checklists and so forth that kind of prompt you as to potentially what you might need. Yes.
she'll be a new student this year. Um, we've been told that she won't need a 504. <coughs> teachers are all flexible. She can do whatever she needs to do. And all this. And it is a small place, and my husband works in the school system, not in this particular building. But um, so we feel a little awkward, like, mm -hmm. you know, these are the people who are so this. We don't want to call her any waves, but at the same time, I don't know what their ramifications, like for instance, if there's um, standardized testing, will <coughs> that affect if she doesn't have a 504, will they not be able to allow her to So, So again, early on in my career, I encountered families just like that. Oh, we, we, you know, we have wonderful folks over at the school and they're very supportive and so forth. Um, a, your child is the second one there, right? So chances are they haven't experienced every potential, you know, thing that could happen, right? Um, B, in all fairness to them, Again, they may not have gone through X, Y, or Z with that other student. So I think it's an opportunity, and I absolutely appreciate your, your approach to this, right? It's an opportunity for you to say, hey, there are some tools here that will not only help you assist to um, potentially anticipate things that you haven't thought of, but that will ensure that you guys are within the legal requirements for doing X, Y, and Z. And, and again, there's a template, and, you know. It's not as if you're saying, we need you to hire an attorney to do all these things. If you're coming in with saying, hey, we have these tools available, there are these templates. Again, it's that notion of approaching it from a collaborative perspective. And it's a level of commitment that is no longer negotiable. We're right. getting married now. We're not dating anymore. <laughs> I know you're a good guy, we're getting married now. It's a what, different what, scenario. What are you implying? <laughs> so, um, blame it on us. Say, you know, I feel really comfortable and grateful. I've had nothing but, uh, you know, great, and I, I want to continue that way. But my medical team is telling me that this is necessary so that my child does well in school and does well in college. And this is just something that we as parents should be doing. Blame us. Thank them for the collaboration and tell them that you continue, that we're going to continue to work well together, but this is an important thing that I as a parent should be doing for my child. And there, might be, yeah, and there might be a change of staff as well, so, yeah. you know, having that in place. Yes, ma'am, and then we'll go to the back. Well, this does follow them, this will follow them to college, and the advantage is when they get to college is uh, different types of testing, you know, whether it's high school. You're absolutely correct. So it, it, it behooves you, even if you wouldn't use that 504, it behooves you to get it no matter what. And, and that's our perspective. And I should mention, they, at the college level, many times there are different terms from 504, but it's, it's related. Every, every college, whether it be community college, university, has an office of disabilities, typically associated with student health, and, uh, and those same rights are, are open. So living near a kitchen, having a refrigerator in your room, making sure that you're situated in a place that's safe. You do this before housing, before you do this in the very beginning. It's really important for our college kids to be safe and to get the accommodations that are correct. Sometimes they go with a buddy that they grew up with that know them, and you really want them to house together. So you want to do this on the front end, um, and it's gonna sound cruel, but you know, when you hit the college level, they don't know you personally, individually. You just didn't show up, the poor kids got a blood sugar of 450, and they didn't show up for their exam. You can't do it in reverse. So you can't then go to the disability office and claim it there. You, That's a zero. You can, but it's much more difficult. Again, laying the groundwork ahead of time. Ahead of time. Um, yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry, yes. Um, I just want to make a comment on that. My kid was in 504 and he was the only guy that had been in because two years before we made our 504 because my mom was an administrator of the system. So she was in a middle level system. And when we, I came up to the principal and I said, well, I want to, I'm like, you got to go stay with them and then all of them and it was so much easier. Like they, even being a small group, they were more accessible because then there was different things. 
So all of you need to get family members that are members of the school district or administration. <laughs> <laughs> but be prepared. Yes. Does the Bible for me be redone every year or just that page that you were, you, you were talking about? Right. In the so typically the diabetes medical management plan, which is step one, yes. most schools every year. Um, we've encountered some situations where, you know, again, the family, for whatever reason, they were, I don't know, in Europe on vacation, they didn't get around to doing it, and the school is kind enough to say, well, until you get the new one, we'll use last year's. But that diabetes medical management plan um, changes, and so as a consequence, what I advise folks is to revisit this. You know, again, your child maybe was requiring everything be done with them, blood sugar checks and insulin shots and so forth. You know, now they're a year older, they've gained additional responsibilities and skills, and so, yeah, it, it should change. Some of the things stay the same with regards to accommodations for testing and so forth, but it changes a little bit. Yes? This up earlier. So, what she, yep. so what I was told by others is that then technically the school has to follow the one from last school year because that's the only one I yep. signed off. Mm -hmm. So again, you, you know your legal rights, and that's really important. Janet brought up earlier that on some schools, basically, if there's a form that you sign that says my child is uh, manages their diabetes independently, and it implies then that the school has no. Um, responsibility. That's not legal, right? So I, I always kind of, when I come across that form, um, the school requires it, I always add something at the bottom that basically says um, the school still needs to be aware um, and needs to, uh, legally has a responsibility to care for that child in the event that they're not able to do it themselves. So who generally The school, the school is supposed to develop it in conjunction with the family, adhering to the diabetes medical management. That's step one. Okay, um, did I do this one? I think so. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm, you know, hopefully we're beyond this. I'd like to think that if you're looking at the uh, the news that's coming out of New York lately, um, we're not done. Uh, so I, I mentioned this earlier. Just because, and hopefully we'll knock on wood here, um, just because your children are in school, if they, hopefully not, shut down again, right? Hopefully not. But these things still apply. You know, if you're doing Zoom-based learning and the, the teacher, the school has a policy that your child needs to be present, you know, for X percentage of time, there needs to be the combination that if your child has a low, or a high, and they need to step away from that computer screen to deal with it, that there's this accommodation, that there's this understanding. And, um, you know, the behavioral and psychological support as well should be there. And so those are important accommodations. And um, um, because, yes, 10 minutes, thank you. Um, we are, and that wasn't sarcastic at all. No, no. Um, but the, I want to mention this again. This, these slides are available on the CWD website. All right, um, Crystal's gonna be so upset with me that I didn't finish the slides. Okay. We, we can never replace Crystal. <laughs> I'm so sorry she wasn't able to come out. She does it every year, and I encourage you to touch base every year uh, to pop into this talk, and I, we, you know, it's such an important topic, and it's an evolving topic, as hopefully we improve uh, the rights and the situation for our patients every year is going to look a little different. Um, masking policy, right? You know, be aware of that. Um, something that, you know, came up very early on when kids started going back to school or in school districts where they never shut down. 
um, my kid needs to go to the nurse's office to get his insulin. But then there's this other kid that's got COVID symptoms that's coming into the same. So the requirement is that you have two different places, right? Because your child in that particular instance might require going to the school nurse to get their insulin. They need to have a, a different room where children that felt ill went to. So it's things like that that you need to be aware of. And again, the ADA website has, thank you, um, information on that. And okay. teach your kids to talk to them. Because sometimes parents are shocked in the visits when the kid, when I ask specifically, and they're like, yeah, I'm not allowed to go to the bathroom. And the parent's like, what are you yeah. talking about? That's the diabetes medical management. So the child has to know what their rights are too. So we, we're fighting so hard on the back end, and if the child's not aware, they could be mistreated, and we don't even know that they're not allowed to get have the water bottle or use the bathroom or things that are, That's the you know, exception. Are, are cruel, right? Hopefully. Cruel, yeah. Okay. Uh, we went over much of this. Make sure these things are current. Be a resource for your school. Provide. Again, set your child up for success. Honestly, set up the school nurse and the staff for success as well and help them care for your child. Okay? Resources. Okay? There's lots of stuff on the ADA website. Um, I should mention that there is a volunteer group uh, that I've been associated with for, I'm actually the pediatric endocrinology representative. It's a legal advocacy subcommittee, and there are volunteer disability rights attorneys that cover school, that cover workplace, that cover, hopefully not applicable to you, correctional facilities. Um, you can only imagine. Some kids view school as jail, but um, you know, where you have an inmate that you know you lose most of your rights when you become incarcerated, there are rights for them if they have type 1 diabetes. Hopefully you never have to encounter that, but that's there. So there are lots and lots of resources there, okay? Um, we touched upon this before. There is a specific resource for college, okay? Um, so yeah, there's also you know students with diabetes, there are a lot of organizations, um, they have individual chapters at schools. Now, your child, and I, I meant to mention this before, you've done a great job with your child, they're now moving off to college, they don't want to be known as the kid with diabetes, right? Um, but you should have all that in place so that if they do encounter, you know, with the disabilities office, they encounter a problem with their blood sugar, they have a problem with an exam, all of that is set up ahead of time. Not everybody needs to know. They don't need to wear a CWD t-shirt all the time, right, when they're on campus. But again, it's, it's paving the way and making things easier. So that's important. Um, lots of planning tools. I mentioned the medical management plan. I believe I mentioned that there are resources. In fact, we're in the process of updating. Um, it, there was a manual signed on by all of those organizations that was a resource for school nurses and school personnel. The Safe at School Guide. Okay. And there are modules, training modules, that the ADA has developed for school nurses and so forth. So again, it, it's, it's a wealth of information that I think you definitely should be aware of. And this pertains to child care as well. There are legal, um, there are laws that pertain to um, child care and uh, what's the word I'm looking for, daycare? Daycare. Yeah. Okay. Tongue tie. Something. Okay. And then again, you know, things that we've said again and again with the take-home messages, you already are. You're, you're the best advocates for your kids. Um, it's, it's being collaborative and respectful and understanding that the school might have some limitations, but it's